Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, whiskey lovers, spirits lovers, cork poppers all over Australia and indeed the world. Welcome to another episode of Whiskey Roundtable. My name is Scott Fitzsimons and the burden once again falls upon my shoulders to pull this train away from the station. It's been another big week in whiskey as it always is with many big topics, big moves, big waves, big shakes, none of which we'll probably touch upon tonight as we delve down into the realm of nothingness and absolute rubbish chat. I am joined once again by the regular panel from around Australia, Alex Dallenberg from Whiskey Culture, tuning in live from the Lefroy 25 stand there. Matt Bailey, live from the We've Got Special Glass where we're not afraid to use it stand there. And Andy Milne from Can't Get Any Whiter Than Bondi Backgrounds from <laughs> South Trade, tuning in. And all people around the world, but... We have a very, very special guest joining us tonight, and I do find sometimes that reading bios straight off the website is the best way to introduce because that's how you get to know the essence of a person. Max Allen is an award-winning journalist and author, an honorary fellow, bloody good fellow, in history at the University of Melbourne. Max has been running at booze for almost 30 years, uh, so that's that's pretty early to start when you were two years old, mate. Um, wine and drinks columnist, <coughs> excuse me for the AFR, the Financial Review, for those who uh, were born in the internet age, and, of course, the author um, of a book released last year called Intoxicating, which not only covered uh, wine, which which Max has sort of made his name for, but also all drinks, in fact, drinks that shaped Australia. So, Max, on behalf of the Roundtable, thank you so much for deciding to lower your standards tonight and come and join us for a, for a chat over the next hour. Um, we're going to start this off, as we always do, by saying g'day, and most importantly, what's in your glass tonight? Well, how could I not have whiskey in my glass? Quite, quite easily, actually. Is, is uh, you know, a minute ago it was a glass of Chianti, and a few minutes before that it was a glass of Chenin Blanc from from Western Australia. Oh, oh no, it wasn't. No, it was the new Musket um, Gin from Rutherglen. Have you heard about this beautiful gin? So there's a, a winery in Rutherglen called Scion. Uh, and it's a new wave winery in Rutherglen, you know, makes some really interesting styles of wine. And they teamed up with Backwoods Distillery, I think it is, up there in Yakandanda. The very and shirt they, that Alex is wearing right now. There, there you, you go. go right? So you know all about this, Alex. So they steeped their beautiful late harvested musket grapes in gin and they've produced this musket. Have you talked about it already on the show? You must have. No. Been. Okay. So that's what I had earlier. And what else did I have? Oh, the new brandy from um, Bass and Flinders. Uh, it's called Noble Stranger. It's it's a, just over 100 bucks a bottle. They're aiming at that kind of same market that the bartender's cut from Angove did uh, last year. So that's that's just this evening, right? So what I've got, <laughs> it's not always like that, but it actually pretty is almost like, always like that. What I've got here is the latest whiskey to arrive on my doorstep, which is the musket ah. finish from Adelaide Hills. Which nice. is which is lovely, I think, really sweet and approachable, and as you'd expect. But yeah. it, it happens to be the one to hand. But I think it's going to resonate with some of the things we talk about tonight. Yeah. Excellent, and congratulations, Max. You've obviously watched an episode or two beforehand to realise that you needed a few drinks before coming on here. So you've done that very, very well. <laughs> well I had enough. Is six enough? Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> it's, warm up. Warm up. It's, it's all for research purposes, right? Mm. Mm. Of course. Research. Um, <laughs> That's what we do every day. <laughs> Alex, what's in your glass, mate? I have a Dalu in 16 years, oh. which is lovely, nice. which was a whiskey list, um, sorry, not whiskey list, uh, whiskey club release, uh, which is absolutely beautiful. That's in my glass tonight. And, you know, because I'm classy like that, I had a Reshers before we went on. <laughs> <laughs> it Reshers does refreshes, so, yeah. It does. Yeah. And you, you, know, don't, you, don't, you don't need the does, mate. It's just rushes, refreshes. Don't try right. and adopt it and get it wrong. You either do it right or you don't do it at all. Rushes, refreshes, and bring Thank back you. the dinner ale. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. you just say DA. You don't need dinner ale. You just say DA. People know what you're talking I say, about. I say dinner ale. Uh, <laughs> Matt Bailey, what's in your glass? Uh, just supporting, um, again, a bar that's been closed for a while, Whiskey and Almond. I realised there was actually a bunch of um, our September outturn at the Society that I actually hadn't even had a chance to taste yet. So instead of um, ordering a full bottle of each from the warehouse, which seems a bit wasteful, I, um, I ordered a sample of each and um, it was, it's, I'm plucking through them tonight and I'm halfway through. There's five left out of the 10 that we released. So I've got a, a bit of 35, 42, 134, 29 and two to go. So why not? Oh, it's, wow. it's so unattractive, isn't it? When you hold up those sample bags, it's just—it's just medicinal. It's 
clinical. I, it's just I prefer to hold a bottle, of course, but yes. at the same time, it's yeah. just, you know, whatever. That's all right. I That's was right. just thinking, is this what COVID has, brung, has brought us to? Yes. Yeah. Well, look, it's a, it's a, if it supports it, it's a, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Yeah. They're just mini goon bags. They're really cute. They are really cute. The goon bags are cute. We use little glass <laughs> bottles at the society, but they use goon bags. And I, I, I think one or the other, they, as long as the booze gets delivered. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Scotty. Um, I've, I've gone for an old classic, uh, which is quite fortuitous because I just actually just reached and grabbed something. So I've gone the uh, Bakery Hill Classic Malt. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't get much more classic when it comes to Aussie whiskey than that for me. Um, and uh, sort of a bit of a homage to the DB01 uh, release, which is coming out probably next year that we did a few weeks ago in an event, which is now called Death and or Glory. One's, it's been split. There's one's Peter, one's Unpeter. We don't know whether it's called Death or Glory, but it's quickly emerging as I think going to be one of my top five Australian whiskey releases I've ever tried, which is looking mm -hmm. um, very, very good. So I'm going back to where it all started with some early classic cask. I should I should be taking notes, shouldn't I? Really? Yeah, it's certainly <laughs> not. Absolutely not. Unless you want to take notes to say what not to say to people moving forward in your in your life. <laughs> no, but I, I want to know what's happening. I want to know what's coming up in the whiskey world. Yeah, never yeah. Not never There's not always some wonderful stuff coming up in the whiskey world. Speaking of Andy, what's in your glass? Uh, well, I, 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 no one's going to believe you. <sighs> I thought I'd change things up. Uh, so I'm starting with some red, because uh -huh. this, this, you know, talking wonderful about, classification, just red format. Yeah, just just red. That's it. It's uh, you know, we, we base our wine on color. No, it's uh, Nero Davila from South Australia by Unico Zello. Um, so awesome, awesome Italian varieties that these guys are doing. Uh, and I thought I'd throw in a chaser of Milton Duff from Ooh. the oh. LMDW series. <clears throat> Delicious. All right. No one ever talks about Milton Duff. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much to talk about. Um, right, Scotty, right. you yeah, were. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrestle this one back from Milny there. Um, <laughs> Max, once again, thank you for, for joining us. Now, people who would be familiar with you through your various uh, roles on websites and AFR and, and that sort of stuff, um, we, we'd like to start off with a bit of background into how you got into writing. Um and how you managed to le legitimize, uh, legitimize, that's a word. There we go. Um, legitimize a habit by, uh, by writing about it. Oh, well, this is the big question, isn't it? Have I been able to um, maintain a, what's laughingly called a career as a booze writer for 25 years or so um, because I'm an alcoholic? Or, or has the 25 year career as a, as a drinks writer turned me into an alcoholic? I can't quite work out the chicken or egg of that situation. Um, but it, it is, it is the, the found why I'm doing what I'm doing is from, from childhood, I was always fascinated, fascinated by the taste of, of food and drink. Always like there's a picture of me as a like a toddler, like 18 months old, and I've got a, you know a jam sandwich in my face. Like I've always, I've always just really had this visceral desire to <laughs> to put things in my mouth. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But as far as drink is concerned, uh, you know, from the very first you know memories of getting into beer or cider or whatever when I was a teenager or probably a bit younger. Um, it wasn't long after that, just, just, you know, getting over the whole alcohol thing that I thought, I, I want to find out for myself which of those drinks that are on offer to me I prefer, right? So I remember even before I got into booze, tasting all the lemonades I could find to, to work out which one I liked most for myself. Like, you know, I was like 12 or something. I can't remember. Um, and so when, when I did discover wine and craft beer, uh, growing up in England, it was the camera movement was really big in the 80s uh, and subsequent years. Um, you know, so I'd go to camera pubs and, and and try the real ales on, you know, by the hand pump. So from from the as as early as I can remember being interested in booze, I've been interested in this kind of critical appraisal of it. Um, and then I came out to Australia from England almost 30 years ago and got lucky in that I got a couple of stories published. First for a, a desktop published zine called Divine Food and Drink, 
Food and Wine. Uh, and through that, I got a story published in The Age in 1993, and it's been downhill ever since. Does that answer the question? It does. Yeah. It does. And, and, and for, for those of you who, who may be a little bit more whiskey and spirits focused, um, you know, Max has become one of the, the foremost voices in, um, in wine, particularly in Australia. And I know you're the, um, the Australian correspondent for Jancis Robinson, her website, which is, um, is, is the Bible. You know, it is essentially. But I want to bring this back a little bit, and maybe this ties with it intoxicating a little bit more. Is what is your relationship with with whiskey and, and then water as as spirits? When when in your journey did you start to to pull into that area? Uh, as a drinker, just as a consumer, since the beginning, uh, even before the beginning, um, I just came across some pictures of my mum's wedding. So. I'm in it because she married my stepfather when I was about five years old, right? So there's pictures of of my mum's wedding from the from the mid seven early seventies, and there's an amazing shot of her and her friends at the at the wedding kind of party afterwards, drinking. I think it's Johnny Walker Red Label. I can't quite see the label of the whiskey bottle, but they're drinking whiskey out of wine glasses, right? So big. <laughs> Big glasses of whiskey. So inadvertently, whiskey, whiskey was a part of my upbringing, right? Um, there's a picture of me actually cheersing with my mum as a, as a five-year-old. And my glass has a, a similar golden liquid in it. I hope it's apple juice. I think it's apple juice. But maybe it was Johnny Walker Red Label. I don't know. Um, but as soon as I started working in bottle shops, actually, no, I'll tell you what. When I was living in a share house, when I was at art school in Brighton in England in the late 80s, and I was living in a share house with a bunch of hippies and, and dreadlock anarchists and, and you know, <laughs> one of the guys that lived in our house was, was a hippie. And I was working at an Obbin store at the time, right, in London, in England in the late 80s. Is this right? Am I making this up? No, late 80s, early 90s. And, and the chippy came in and he had a passion for single malt. And he got paid in single malt for doing this work in our shop. And I think that would probably be the time drinking these single malts. And I can't remember, they were probably the classic collections, though, Lagavulin, and Talisker, Darwini. I think he got a few of those. And I think that was probably the, the, the moment where I started getting into, again, going back to what, as a kid, like, which of these whiskies do I like? You know, forget the marketing, forget the bullshit. Which are the ones? And that's where I discovered that my kind of heart's passion for whiskey is definitely in the Isla, smoky, peaty, medicinal, lashed to a mast type whiskey. That's that's where I. That's the whiskey I buy and drink. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I really love and appreciate all the other styles, but that's where I would go as the kind of desert island whiskey style. Yeah, it's very cool. There's a great comment from Ryan before who said it's silly to pigeonhole you just as wine and wine alone. You're a sensational, sensational grog historian and grog philosopher. Um, your book sort of on your intoxicating book is sort of covers a lot of that history. How, how did you sort of even how do you even approach a, a research subject of finding out like the early settlement of rum and and all those the especially I mean the first two or three chapters for me was were quite quite particular to me because they, they were quite focused on spirit. But then you, you did also a whole chapter on um, on VB, which I wanted to get to, but um, <laughs> how did you? How do you even approach a subject? How, how do you even like? Can you can you run us through? I'm just fascinated about the research behind early spirits in Australia and and how you even came about that sort of subject matter. So so uh, the spirits history. So even though I've been drinking whiskey and really appreciating whiskey since you know the beginning of my booze um, life, uh, wine was always the priority. Mm. Um, cider is a personal preference and so that's something that i've kind of you know really i make my own cider so that's a, that's a you know always been a sideline it's been pardon the pun it's it's a great thing to see the cider uh market in australia grow over the last 10 or so years 12 years um but as wine has always been by far the most dominant part of my career mm -hmm. but when i started thinking about the book intoxicating i thought well if i just write about the wines that made australia right there's, it's a big audience, but it's only so big. If I broaden that out to all the drinks that I can think of, suddenly I've got a bigger audience. 
a lot of those drinks I have a deep love of or experience of anyway. So I can I can broaden this out, but I needed to rely on other people's work much more than my own because obviously I've been, you know, literally immersed in wine for almost 30 years. So all the wine stuff pretty much is, is my own research. So it's people like Luke McCarthy, it's websites um, and retailers and relying on other people's histories to really delve into that side of things with spirits. Um, and once I did start doing that, and I'm talking to people like Seb Costello at Bad Frankie, uh, you know, and and getting tips from him about who was doing what in the whiskey world. Um, so it's it's so it's it's very much leaning on and appreciating the work that other people have done in that space, and not ever setting myself up as being the expert in whiskey because I'm absolutely not. You guys are, you know, so much more across what's going on in the scene than I will ever be because you are living and breathing it. No, we just drink it. Up. We just Bre drink it. Breathing it, yes. Knowing about it, yeah, it's up for debate. Well, I'm, 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 I'm out just, of the bottle. Yeah, I'm, you know, a, a lot of the time I pretend to be an expert in these fields just because other people have done all the research that I can that I can use and hopefully attribute as much as I can, uh, as much as, as possible. Um, so it's it's uh, as far as kind of how do you write that as up as a book and do all the research? It, it's oh, I mean really it's a time. It's the time it, you just have to spend an insane amount of time doing the legwork, and whether that's on trove on your laptop or whether it's going to Carayo and realizing that there was a door open and sneaking in and trespassing. Mm. Uh, just so that I could get to see those amazing big stills that are still there in the middle of that incredible old building down in Geelong. That's and being, it, it is just extraordinary. And then doing the same thing at Warren Heap recently. Um, so for those that I'm sure you all know already. but for Breaking and entering. Watching, you're breaking and entering, absolutely. Yep, I okay. highly encourage yeah, yeah. it. Let me just delete that bit later on. Yep, yep done. Um, well, Warren Heap is this. Beep it out, Scotty, beep it out. Sorry, yep. <laughs> yeah, just, just skip that bit incredible bluestone distillery that was first established in the 1860s i think just outside ballarat and it, you can drive past it every day on your way in from you know just outside ballarat into town to work or something and you think oh it's just a, a pile of old bluestone ruins it's one of the most incredible historic resources in australia as far as drinks history is concerned and i had the first time i went to see it was like four months ago mm. i had no idea of the profound uh history that existed in that place and and we did the same as Carayo. like the front gate was open we just drove in and and just hoped that if somebody stopped us i could flash my media pass at them and say i'm a journalist i'm, I'm doing some research <laughs> it's just it's crazy the situation anyway does that no, that probably doesn't answer that question at all well it was pretty close i mean it's but it's, it's obviously it's a hands-on approach to seeing these sites and and see and seeing these places where uh, Australian whiskey had this massive sense of scale. Uh, and Luke, you you referenced Luke McCarthy before. I mean, he recently wrote an article for us at SMWS about the history of Australian whiskey and and the and um for the one forty seven dot one and and that was um that was the the photos and drawings from that era alone give you a sense of scale that I had no idea about. And I'm talking mm. like when you see the stills uh, at these distilleries and there's a man standing next to them on the bottom half of the still. And he doesn't quite even, if assuming he's about six foot, he doesn't even come up to a third of the base of the still, and it's a two-story setup where which would have been tens of thousands of liters in size. Mm. Uh, we don't talk about that. like that's not even part of our history. And, and one of the one of my bugbears, as you'll know, has been that it's we Can talk you about on that on that pony. Get on that pony. I don't know. One of my bugbears is that get on talk, get on that high pony. We, we talk about Australian whiskey in the context of 1992 onwards only, and 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 that's I think a shame. And I think you've sort of your book has sort of opened that discussion a little bit wider for for all to see beyond just spirits, of course, like wine and beer as well and everything, which is great. Yeah, but the interesting thing is because I'm not really part of the whiskey world as much as I'm part of the wine world. Mm. In the is that I'm not really aware of the 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 perhaps tender egos that could be bruised by emphasising the pre-92 history. <laughs> like that. That's um, the best quote for it I've ever heard. Uh, so, uh, so I've been made aware that apparently emphasising this, this early history is, is not necessarily um, 
aligned with everybody's agenda. And I and and that kind of I'm quite happy about that because I think as a somebody who sets himself up as a journalist or somebody who's meant to be writing history, you need to be outside those internal mm -hmm. politics as much as you can, because as far as I'm concerned, it's it's a legacy that we all as Australians benefit from. Mm. Uh, and going to see Charlie Leopoldo's collection, which I wrote about in the Finn Review and maybe you guys have talked about, yeah. which is a guy who worked for United Distillers in the, uh, what was it, 70s and 80s, um, and has an incredible collection of, of uh, unbelievable collection uh, of historical items that refer, that relate to this early history of Australian whiskey. Um, you know, it's it just made me realise how, how this, this whole bit of our lives and our culture and our country that that we aren't aware of. And, and everything we can do to become more aware of that history enriches us as Australians, I think. If you're looking at it from a kind of really idealistic perspective. Anyway, yeah. Um, so yes, I, that's my research into whiskey history. Very cool. I'd like to ask a question. Um, yeah. You have been in this industry for 30 years, I believe, writing, correct? Yeah. Um, I've just recently done an interview article um, for a magazine about uh, what have I seen change throughout my career. Um, what have you seen change uh, in the last 30 years in the drinks industry um, across wine and whiskey? Because for me, I said that it was a bit of a change that we've gone from uh, drinking as a pastime to a passion. Absolutely. Oh, the, the if you said to somebody working in the drinks trade in Australia in the early 90s, and remember Australia at that time was coming out of recession. So, um, you know, I remember when places like the Gin Palace and the City Wine Shop and those kind of game-changing places and the George uh, in St Kilda that Don Levy Fitzpatrick opened at about the same time, the early 90s, how those places uh, and Myers Place Bar, for example, which was I think was the first small bar in Melbourne of the modern era, um, how those places, when they opened, they seemed super radical. And now there's a bar literally everywhere. You know, you can't walk around the corner and, you know, in, in the before times, uh, you, you can't walk around the corner without tripping up over, you know, people spilling out of a neighbourhood wine bar or, you know, or, or a whiskey bar or... You know, they're everywhere and bottle shops that allow you to come and drink in, inside and order in pizza or, you know, those things are, we just absolutely take for granted. And anybody born after 1990, whatever it was, no, 1980, whatever it was, that the uh, Neuenhausen report in Victoria, I'm talking about Victoria, of course, um, changed the law. So when I arrived in, early, in, in Melbourne in the early 90s, you still had to say when you walked into a restaurant that if you wanted to have a glass of wine, you had to say, I intend to dine. Because the licensing at that time, there was still a hangover that just walking into a bar and having a glass of wine and sitting down like you would in any city in Europe was not allowed. Right. So the fundamental change in, in Australian drinking is how we've made just the casual drinking, the the accessibility of drinking being a part of everyday life, a part of everyday life. Because 30 years ago, it wasn't. It wasn't. If you wanted to just go and have a glass of wine or a beer, you had to go to a pub, not just somewhere around the corner. It's 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 almost impossible to describe that, that, that what that was like. The diversity of drinks on offer now is through the roof different to what it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, vermouth is a really good example, I think, of a drink that when I started writing about booze was not produced in Australia apart from de Bortoli, yeah. the only producers. And now everybody's got a vermouth or a bitters or a Amaro or a, you know, it's only in the last 10 years, less than 10 years, that vermouth has been a part of Australian drinking culture. 30 years ago, forget it. Mm. Any talk of Indigenous ingredients, which we all take for granted, um, we'll come back to the whiskey, but the idea of ageing a single malt whiskey in Australia in in native Australian wood, Jarrah, for example, it, Red gum. It, it, inconceivable that anybody would have even thought of that 30 years ago. Mm. A, we don't make whiskey in this country, 
because <laughs> everybody had forgotten. And B, why would you put a single knot in, in Jarrah wood? Like, why would you do that? And now we're all thinking that's so cool. It's, it, it's, I'm, I'm not, thinking, I'm not. Whiskey should never be in Jarrah wood. Red oh, gum on your go back on that pony. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I totally disagree. <laughs> I mean, apart from the respiratory issues that are caused with it, with using that wood type and other things, but sure, sure, we should we should use Jarrah more. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> don't get me started. Don't, let's not get started on wild fermentation then. Right? Okay. <laughs> oh, get me started <laughs> on it. Let's go. Uh, I'll talk about <laughs> wild fermentation for hours with you. I mean, this is this, uh, hold on. Okay. At the risk of, of of derailing the conversation completely, but that the, fair enough. I was being a bit boring. But <laughs> why, why, <laughs> why? Can you tell me? You tell me. Why are more spirits producers, not just whiskey, but let's just talk about whiskey, why is there not more wild fermentation going on? What are people oh, afraid of? Agreed. Totally agreed. In in beer or in spirits or both? Spirits. spirits. There's some interesting stuff going on in beer, still not enough, I don't think. What What, what is it about wild fermentation in whiskey that, that, that distillers are scared of? I, 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 I think it almost comes down to a point that while a lot of the guests that we have on you know, we're open to that concept. A lot of people still aren't putting a huge amount of, you know, gravitas into the fermentation part of whiskey distillation. Okay. I think I think we're speaking to the zero point one percent, and I think people are going. Let's talk about barrels and maybe still shape. Let's not worry about that. That's a little bit too hard, and you know that that might open another conversation into how many distilleries in Australia are making whiskey do their own brewing and own fermentation as opposed to buying it off someone else. I think that that's sort of that's all tied separate, into that conversation. That's a separate conversation and then we'd have to talk about that and we would be here all night. That's the special oh, extras DVD offline yeah. when we go off camera yeah. that we can fight that out. <laughs> I, <laughs> it also comes, I, down I would, to, it comes down to risk as well, Max. Sorry, uh, sorry, Andy. It comes down to risk. It, it, like if you, if you, if you, if you, if you a traditionalist, a, Matt. It comes. Out, it's it's economic risk. If you if you screw up a beer, if you screw up a fermentation on a beer, you've lost half a day, maybe. Like if you, but if you screw up a wild fermentation on a cask, and you've got to put that down for two or three years, like you you are looking at the the risk reward factor of like oh that might taste like garbage in two years. Most people aren't willing to take that. It's the same with their cask usage and their spirit usage and their barley types, and and most of those decisions are based economically, and that's that's a reality. But there's probably other reasons. I yeah I I would add to that. And it's to link it back to the experience I think you had, Max, that you, know, you use wild fermentation, you can get some funky notes, you can get some unusual characters, and you can get some you know really cool elements that come in. Mm. That in a beer, that in a wine is blended and perfectly sort of molded in with the fi you know, final product. And and you've you've got that and you know when to temper it, you know when to exacerbate it, and, and you're perfect. When I remember you talking about um, the the cider that you tried to make, uh, and then you distilled it, and you were saying, you know, how it initially tasted great, and then tasted like absolute pish, mm. and then distilled it, and you were kind of in that development. There was, you know, some really good elements and some really poor elements, and you know, it really highlights and, and brings them out. And that's, I think, that's the biggest challenge: is distillation really exacerbates and highlights things and if you get it right god oh, i'm sure it's perfect but when you're dealing with something wild and i suppose that comes back into matt's concept of you know the economics is that if you can get it perfect superb but when you're dealing with several flavors that are competing and then that one thing comes forward you're buggered but uh, out. It's, also training. it's also training, though, by the way. Sorry, it's also training. Like how few people actually know how to uh, train distillers oh. as well. Oh, so you, Max, you've started something. <laughs> this, this could go pretty, this could go pear-shaped. And here we were thinking that you'd, you'd settle, like have a nice, quiet conversation no, no, with no, us. No, and no, you've no, just... No, there's no... There's you no, there's fucked no that up. <laughs> Good <laughs> job. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Obviously, there's there's a, a few reasons why I ask. Why I obviously understand the economics of it. Uh, I understand that funky flavors, for want of a better word, can be um, are, are by definition amplified, augmented, whatever the word is, through distillation. Yeah. Um, I just wonder where, and I don't agree that with wine and beer that they, that they've got a handle on it at all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, beer, beer, beer does it because it's easy. That's why they yeah. do it. No, but that's that's not true either. But, it's, <laughs> but it possibly is. 
I think with wine, potentially with some beers, there's a there's a bunch of winemakers who are making wines with indigenous ferments, wild ferments, ambient ferments, whatever you choose, non-cultured ferments, spontaneous, who produce <laughs> wine that is undrinkably awful, and yet the market is prepared to drink it because for whatever reason, oh, it's cloudy, it's funky, it's cool, right? It is is the Pet market for potentially funky oh. whiskey, You're right, right? So no, 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 the there are some excellent pet nets out there. Like, oh, I'm, that, I'm sorry, Max, but are. there are some brilliant ones, and I see it all the time, and I see it also in beer. That's my mm -hmm. sort of comment is because it's easy, and there's faults, and they, as you say, pass it off and go, that, that'll find someone will drink that because it's different. You've done a 180 it's on cool that. It's cool to be then. different. It's not a European yeah. you know, opinion on has done a 180, and I appreciate that. Because it's, it's very yeah. traditional, good ones. It's like it's like meeting Matt Bailey, right? <laughs> you go and have a discussion. It's not to everyone's taste. Some people are going to put up with it because maybe he's going to shout you a beer so you will get something out of it at the end of the night. But for the vast majority, you go like, why am I doing this? This isn't fun at all. <laughs> but, and, I, and I suppose climate comes into this massively as well, just to rail it back into yeast. Um, but you know, there's, <laughs> there's, it was going to go too bad. It was going to go left. I, I suppose there, there is that element where you've got, you know, in your traditional whiskey making countries, you know, Scotland, particularly, you know, wild yeasts are far less prevalent and, and much harder to come by in a winter, for example. And so, you know, in those examples, you need something to just make sure it, it keeps going and actually keeps happening. Otherwise those ferments will just stop. Um, Rum less so, and you know, you know the, the the whole thing of you know we talk about you know these, and I'm always going on a, uh, to Scotty about some of you know my favourite kind of agricole rums, and you know that real dunder and funk that you get in rum that's a, a, a true character of of rum to me. So I think it definitely is something that could be explored because well, think, rum seems rum seem to be getting it right, and they they seem to do it well. So I think there's there's a lot we can learn from them you've put your finger on it, the true character. And so that's that's where I'm kind of heading, trying to get this conversation to head is that people, people it seems to me there's a lot of conversation about what is Australian whiskey. Yep. Um, and the same conversation is going, is, is happening to a certain extent with other spirits. But actually, no, when I think about it, it's probably happening more in, a, in whiskey than, than other spirits because gin is just... Uh, whatever goes, right? Yeah, there is no definitive of and it's 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 we have a lot of gin, and there's no rules. Go play. <laughs> and also, gin is pretty much. Oh, I'm going to get into such trouble now. Bring it. <laughs> Painting by numbers, really, isn't it? Like you can, <laughs> you can just make a gin by buying all the shit in. Sorry, but you can. And then there's obviously there's a bit of skill involved in the redistilling of the stuff that you buy in. But with whiskey, by definition, regardless of this idea of where the wash comes from and who does the fermentation, it's still there's a lot more craft involved. Oh, I'm getting myself into such trouble. So with with whiskey, it's a more legitimate argument is what is Australian whiskey? And I just wonder whether, like you say with agricole rum, it, at the some way down the track, somebody will, and they're already showing signs of doing it perhaps, somebody will crack the indigenous ferment whiskey and go everything in everything everything in this whiskey is from here the water the barley maybe not even barley maybe it's a different grain somewhere down the track the fermentation the wood everything is australian is that a truly australian whiskey and that's one of the reasons why i thought that was a good example because the musket barrel is such a iconic overused word australian drink right yeah so is is there an Australian whiskey? And, and one of the wines, one of the spirits that I think goes some way to answer this is Lantana Gin. So Lantana Gin, if you haven't tried it, is apparently biodynamically grown sugarcane from Queensland, wild fermented, and then the botanicals include Lantana, which is such an iconic Australian weed. Um, so, and that, that gin is not a classic gin by any remote stretch of the imagination, but, geez, it's a really delicious, interesting, funky and characterful spirit. And I wonder whether there's room for people in the whiskey world to, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, be a bit more open-minded 
and less 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 pigeonholed with 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 uh, restrained by what the models are of the classics and I'm, that's coming from somebody who doesn't consider themselves as part of the whiskey world yeah no, i'm going to i'm, I'm, I'm going to get on great <laughs> yeah I, i'm going to jump in there max because i've tried that lantana gin and i tried it a, a few or two or it was before lockdown the last time i tried it so i presume it's it's evolved since then um and i think that was a quite a classic example of a gin that you, you question the benefit of making your own base spirit to make a gin yeah. when with the cost associated, when it is going to be so disparate to the rest of the market. But I want, I want to sort of, you know, wheel that back into, into whiskey and you sort of touched upon it there. We, you, you would know more about this than us, but, you know, in, in the, the 80s and 90s, you know, Australia had a, a wine explosion and, and mm-hmm. you know, people go out. I feel there's a, a bit of few similarities there in terms of, people of a, of a certain age and certain means retiring from the major cities, wanting to make something with their hands for the first time, you know, instead of going to Orange and to the Yarra Valley and, you know, building Burgundy in Australia, they're doing it in, in different areas. Um, but that didn't go for everyone particularly well during that boom. So when you look at the at the whiskey scene right now, can you see any similarities? And in your opinion, as are those people that, as you say, those 78 degrees, you know, really challenging the notion of what is Australian whiskey going to be better or, or more sufficient than those who are maybe going, we're making Scotch 3.0 with an Australian yeah. barrel. Yeah, I, um, yeah, there are parallels. There, are, there's always parallels between uh, any kind of boom craft industry. So we saw it happen with wine, as you say, in the 70s, 80s. Um, there was the kind of first wave of boutique, and they were all doctors and lawyers, and you know, um, and they could afford the land back then. <laughs> then there was then there was a kind of wave of international um, uh, investment from people, you know, like Chandon setting up the sparkling wine house in the era, and and maybe some some more professional wine people getting into the to business. And in the last ten years, it's been characterised by every single sommelier in the country who started up their own wine label and bought a ton of fruit because they can't afford to buy land and <clears throat> and renting space and producing their own you know cool little label right so there's been these waves of 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 development uh, and you see those similar things happen and then the the pioneers get bought out by the larger companies which get consolidated into their even bigger companies so yes the patterns definitely repeat um and you see people fall by the wayside and i think i think like any boom you will see people emerge and disappear Uh, it may have already happened you probably know better than me about the brands that have been and gone um and the you like to think that regardless of what it is, and cider is a good example of this of a massive boom, huge boom, then a plateau, and we're really plateauing with cider at the moment, if not declining. Um, you like to think that the ones who really know what they're doing and do it well and okay. establish a really good foothold in the market survive. So I, I, I think that's what will happen. It doesn't always work that way. There's people who deserve to survive who don't. Same with restaurants, all those things, and you know the challenges that everybody's been through in the last eighteen months has made has, has deepened the the difficulty for everybody. Obviously, um, but yes, I have seen similar things happen. I'll tell you what's really interesting is seeing how the different booze communities handle competition and information sharing. Yeah. Wow. The wine industry don't always tell you 100% of the truth, certainly don't always tell me 100% of the truth by any means, but, geez, they're really good at supporting each other. Mm. And that's partly because there's so many of them. They can't afford to be precious, right? So there's incredible, so there's thousands of them, right? Not hundreds, thousands. And not like the whiskey industry where we're still kind of dozens rather than hundreds. Um and when the cider boom kicked off, I saw this remarkable preciousness and lack of cooperation. Everybody was competing for what they saw as a small part of the market. I think that's certain death. I think the strength of, a, of a, any kind of sector in, in any kind of industry absolutely relies on this free sharing of ideas and, and collaboration and cooperation because if, every, so if, if one person succeeds, everybody succeeds. So I think that's, if there's any people in the whiskey industry watching, um, that's something I would really, really, and any booze industry, like the more you can help each other out and collaborate and cooperate, the better. 
That's what I, I like to think. I like to think that the Australian whiskey industry is pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, from what I've seen, and I don't know whether they might just be saying nice things to me, but um, from what I've seen, that they they seem to be quite uh, supportive and help each other. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. All coming up and along. Um, yeah, I think I think it's maybe a little mixed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I stood up in well, front. This, you're all sitting there and you want to say something, but you're not. <laughs> I, have a, I have a bit of a controversial what, question. Do, do, uh, Hold yeah. on, Alex. Just to cap off on that, I, I'm, I'm going with Andy. I think it's mostly a mixed bag. I think there's a lot of sort of, there's a few sort of distilleries and 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 companies that are more interested in um in um uh, the the size of the slice rather than growing of the pie, as I like to say. You know, that sort of. And, and mm. I think if you, if you look at sort of the growth of the whole industry, the whole trade is far more interesting as, as it's as we've seen in the wine trade. You you aptly put it that way. You wouldn't be able to sustain thousands of different wine brands if if it if they didn't have that. That's that's yeah. really what propelled them in, in in size. And I think that's important. Sorry, Alex, your controversy. Okay, it's the the, the the great the great quote of Clint. Is it Clinton? I think it was. Is it a rising tide lifts all, lifts all ships? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't well, think I've it's, heard that it's... said in Tassie quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think Bill Lark owns that one now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> trademarked. Yeah. Uh, trademarked. Probably not the only one either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alex, let's right, get controversial. Alex. Um. Oh, maybe I don't know. So I stood up uh, at the Wine List of the Year Awards in front of a bunch of wonderful songs and called them wine wankers and introduced myself as a whiskey wanker. Um, being in both worlds and writing about both worlds, um, who's worse, whiskey wankers or wine wankers? Whiskey. I'm not even going to let you get to the end of the question. Whiskey. You're not wrong. They're not wrong. Oh, they absolutely are the worst. They are the worst. Sorry. They whiskey. are the worst. They are, worse. they are the worst. And when, when I say the worst, what I mean is they're, I mean, they're not the worst because if you're in the space, it's fabulous, right? So when, when I say, so, okay, well, let me qualify that. I think. <laughs> There's probably more people in my ex limited experience, well, not my limited ex experience of wine, so my fairly extensive experience of wine, There's I, I come across a lot of people that talk as though they know far more than they do. And if that's the definition of being a wanker, then, yes, there's lots of them. But in terms of nerds and geeks, whiskey hands down. Right. When you go to a wine tasting, even even kind of super top level Burgundy wine tastings or Pinot Noir, you know, thousand dollar a head Pinot Noir events, and people oh, crap on like about that. people crap on about clones and terroir and soil types and climate and all that stuff that we love to talk about, it doesn't even come close to the level, the the d detail and obsession over detail that I've heard from whiskey crowds at whiskey tastings. Yeah. Like I'm sitting there at this, it was a whiskey tasting, whiskey and almond, I can't remember what it even was, <clears throat> obviously a couple of years ago now. And I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking, what if I was if if I was sitting in a room full of wine people talking like this, like I would want to just walk out because it's so <laughs> To You're talking me. about the guests or the presenters? <laughs> no, the, the level of detail on the talk, my God. And also how, how the, the really geeky end of the whiskey, whiskey collector crowd are just so over the numbers and, and, and the histories of the barrels and that, like, mm. no wine person gets into that much detail that I've ever come across. <laughs> uh, um, uh, unless you're in, like, a you know, a... Uh, um, uh, classification tasting in a winery where you've got 150 barrel samples of Shiraz and they have to, you know, literally compare each what they're tasting to the um, chemical analysis of the wine. But that's not punters. That's like winemakers in a, in a – it's extraordinary. So is that – yes, whiskey wankers, absolutely outright wine. I had a feeling that might be I would, I would caveat that with – thought you might. The, the reason that I moved from <laughs> wine predominantly in my career into into spirits was ABV is, level. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, don't get me started it wasn't, on that. Wasn't, <laughs> but I think there's the, you're you're completely right. The 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 level of geekery and fucking intense. Like, you know, I, I always talk about a friend of mine being asked about pH levels in the wash at a tasting in Sweden. It's just like who gives a Fuck. Um, <laughs> yeah, no one cares. Um, but the the, the difference is, and I think 
it's it is different here in Australia. I think I I haven't attended as many wine wine events here in Australia, but I, I get the impression just from the culture that the the wine tastings you went to in the UK, I you know especially as a young person as well, I was just like, what the fuck do you know? You know nothing, and no one's going to help you. And the only person I ever recall ever turning around and saying, do you not know about this? Let me tell you. And she was the the chairman of the Saki Association uh, in Great Britain. Uh, mm. Absolutely wonderful lady that it's given me a huge passion for Saki. But no one in wine was just like, oh, you don't know about this? Let me let me teach you. Let me tell you. You know, everyone turned around and was like, you don't know the 84 vintage? Fuck off. You know, and it's just, that was, you know, that was their, you, know you don't know. Oh, jog on. Whereas in spirits, you know, I went to a rum tasting for the first time and, and I was like, I don't really know that much about rum. And this guy just like grabbed me as I was like, right, off we go. You're going to talk to this person and this person, and this person, and this person. And I walked out knowing shit loads about rum. And it's, I think there's, there's an intensity of geek, but there is a community that I think is probably stronger, maybe less of a sort of difference here in Australia, but there's definitely a stronger community in spirits of, let, let's teach you and, and help you learn mm. when there's still that slight elitism in wine of, you know, we know what we're doing and you don't. <laughs> I don't I, know. Do, uh, do you find, do you find that in Australia? I think you can get lucky. I think you can get lucky and, uh, and unlucky. Um, I've been pretty lucky early on getting into wine of, of having some very generous and very open and very helpful people. Um, and sometimes, you, you know, I hear stories from other people who are trying to get into the wine business and sometimes, sadly, it's it's the same people that have been helpful to me have been unhelpful to them. Uh, so, so I think luck is is a part of it. I think, in general, I've found wine people unbelievably generous and open and and hospitable and welcoming. There, there is absolutely, and I think there is with whiskey too, or any kind of booze. There, there is a kind of unofficial global club of wine people. If you turn up to to a, a vigneron's table anywhere in the world and you show a passion and a knowledge and an understanding, you'll be welcomed and you'll be given lunch and, you know, given a few bottles to take away with there. It, there is definitely a family of wine and that's, that's the family I've, I've known more than whiskey, but I've seen similar instances, certainly in Australian whiskey. I think you're right. It's definitely a, a lot more welcoming here than, than other places from my limited experience. Yeah, and just just to touch on that, Melody, the best thing about those eighty four wankers was the fact, or the fact um, that probably what they're drinking is fake, and they're too scared to admit it. Um, <laughs> which certainly happens in whiskey as well, but not as much. Let's move along. Look, um, before we jump into Proust, um, I think Alex is going to yell at me if she's got one more question. Maybe I have I one more question. Okay, you got one. I want to take one from the audience as well. Go I've been it. holding on, Peter Bignall, for about fifty minutes. I've been waiting to ask, but Get you it. go, you go, Alex. Oh, okay. This is from a. This is a personal question from me. Um, I've I've played a little bit with writing um, when I am experiencing something called going something, I write down things. Um, I've done a little bit of writing for a couple of publications. But for me, I'm always so scared about putting my opinion out there, even though I know I'm quite well researched and um, I do know a little bit. Like I'm not claiming to know much as much as some people, especially on this panel. Um, but how do you how do you click send? Um, with what you're <laughs> writing and how do you how do you have that, I don't know, I call it the balls, to put your opinion out there? Uh, yeah, delusion. Um, <laughs> uh, you've got nothing to lose by clicking send. You've got nothing <clears throat> to lose by clicking send. That yeah. I always, always recommend people click send because you never know what can be the right thing at the right time for somebody who's looking out for a piece uh, if they're if, for, if they're an editor or they're, or they're desperate for content or you know and they or the, or they've read something uh, you know you never know and this is I say this kind of a lot of the time to people who send me you know requests to send samples or something like I try and be as polite as I can because you never know when I'm sitting there thinking you know I'll let I'll, a real life example I want to do a story on smoke right smoke and drinks. Because I've tasted a few interesting smoky smoke influenced drinks recently, and I've got like two or three, and I want another one for for a story, let's say. And so I could be thinking that and thinking I want to put this story in a couple of weeks, and out of the blue, somebody sends me some information about a smoky peaty whiskey or whatever it is, and it's like, oh, that's the right thing at the right time, you beauty, right? 
So you never know what could be the right thing at the right time for somebody. So always press send and yeah. then, then be prepared to suffer from dreadful imposter syndrome for at least 10 years into your career. It's uh, real. Which, which is totally real. For, the, for so many years, I honestly, I would sit at tastings or be at a winery in, or be flown around the world to go and visit a winery or whatever, or be, you know, tasting some $3,000 bottle of whiskey or something and be expecting somebody to tap me on the shoulder and say, okay, you've had your fun, you know, you, you've had a good go, but off you go, let the real people take over. So How do you handle that? You just Drink quick. <laughs> Drink more or, you know, they, they, they want you to write another story for them so you can't be doing all you know you can't be completely an idiot um so i so both that would be my advice so always press send and be prepared to doubt yourself for a long time yeah okay. uh, Ronnie, just 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 before we get it and i know that this is probably a conversation for another time but also maybe a conversation that you can go and buy a book and read all about it but i wanted to do a shout out to Peter Bignall, if you can hold out that book. And I don't have the – we have a store copy here of Intoxicating, but it's with our wine department at the moment. It's not with me. Um, but Peter Bignall from the Belgrave Distillery, talking about wild yeast and experimenting, all that sort of stuff. Here's a man who's done it all. Um, I have your Intoxicating book. So I said to read about the clone of Tasmanian cider gums. love to try and find some sap to ferment and distill. <sighs> Planted some cider gums about 30 years ago, but none survived at Bothwell's lower altitude. And I want to roll that into a, a quickly, you know, a, a 30 second uh, discussion about that, but then also indigenous drinks in Australia. So we, we talk about in, in whiskey, not knowing about the pre 92 era, but as a drinking culture, I don't think we know about, you know, there's more going back and further. So you want to touch on that uh, very, very quickly and, and potentially, you know, for twenty nine ninety five at your favorite online bookstore. I would love, I would love to see what Peter could do with cider gum sap uh, distilled. Wow it would be almost impossible because the trees, even the trees up in the central highlands that I saw and tasted the drink, uh, tasted the sap off the tree and have tasted the fermented drink, you, you, it would take a week for one of those trees to fill that glass. Oh, and longer, right? After in fermentation and distillation, yeah. you know, we're talking about the economics, it would be seriously, uh, seriously uneconomic, but, geez, it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. See what that would taste like. Um uh, and and Peter's very important point in that question is that they are incredibly climate sensitive. There's a guy in Gippsland who who grew uh, thousands of them, hoping that it could potentially be the Australian maple maple syrup industry, and found again this, they don't flow commercially. So uh, and they're incredibly climate sensitive, <clears throat> um, and they are under threat from climate change. So uh, that's why it's such a potent story. Not only is it a a really profound indication that fermentation happened in Australia before 1788, um, but it's also a plant that is under threat from climate change. Um, the interesting thing as, as far as this discussion is concerned is that distillation arrived in Australia before 1788 too. So there are examples in the Torres Strait of um, steamed palm wine called tuba being distilled and drunk by um, islanders up on Murray Island and places like that for hundreds of years before um, the uh, Europeans arrived in the 18th century or 19th century. Um, so there's an opportunity there. But again, that culture of producing drink in the, that part of the world seems to have kind of faded away a little bit. Um, so it would be a, a really long and difficult conversation to have with the local people to reinstitute and reinstigate that culture. So it's one of the most fascinating things about doing this book was learning all that stuff about pre-European fermentation, but it almost always comes with really difficult conversations about the role of that culture at the time and how that culture has been treated by Europeans ever since 1788. So it's a bit of a kind of difficult conversation to finish on so i believe you have some some fun questions <laughs> to, yeah. to move well, that's, on. Well, that's actually the end of the first part of this show and max i don't know if we've got nine more to go uh tonight <laughs> so we're, we're just europe's about to wake up well, so we have to welcome I'll them onto myself the another one then let's yeah, do it good. all right um, hit him with a hit him with a fun one yeah I, we're gonna start we're gonna do the prowse questions which uh, i think i sent you an example of um which is we each ask you a question from the prowse questionnaire uh yeah. and you have to answer it as as detailed or as, as little as you want, but it's 
as the question is, though. So and it's pretty yeah. quick. And they're, I they're deliberately, good. I deliberately didn't look at your example. Great. So that, so that this okay. Is completely okay. Clear. Okay. Um, now you, I'm asking this question, this this press question, purely because uh, your role is across every category, really, of booze. So I, I'm actually really keen to hear from you as a as you've called yourself a non whiskey person, if you like. Uh, uh, what do you appreciate most in a whiskey? Ah, oh, that's interesting. I want a whiskey to take me somewhere. So oh. and I think that's why I really respond to those extreme smoky island whiskies mm. because they take me to the sea. They take me to the windswept coast. They take me to the peat bogs. You know. Um, so I think that would my, be my instinctive response. Like, you know, yeah. I want whiskey to take me somewhere. Yeah, I like that. I really like that. That's a good it's answer to that. Share most, yeah, because you would you would taste a lot in your in, in your travels, of course, and as you say, but you you appreciate it's what you appreciate most is those smoky sort of ones that take you to like the windswept coast and what. That's cool. Very cool. But, but also, it takes me back to my you know early experience of whiskey. So it's a kind of comforting thing as well as being a travel thing. Very cool, uh, Scotty. Me, okay, um, all right. I, I, this this one's a, a reasonably easy. Well, this is not an easy one, but it's a pretty open one. Um, what is your happiest whiskey memory? Uh, <laughs> Sucked in, Alex. Yes. No. What was that whiskey that you showed, Alex? Was it Daluan? Is that how you pronounce it? Daluan. Daluan. Yeah. Oh, I didn't Matt, correct you then. Matt, I was like, Matt oh. had to come in. We got Matt Sellen on the stream, and Matt Bloody Bailey has to go and correct him on something. Well, no, it's, uh, I'm, it's, fuck, I'm, Matt. I'm, we're trying okay, to make so friends here. You're be cool. <laughs> was uh, on holiday with my wife in Scotland three years ago and going to Grant Town. There's a little bar in Grant Town on Spay. Um, which is a little whiskey bar behind the main street there, and they had a bottle of that. I can't remember what, how old it was, uh, and another one. And just sitting there in this little bar in Grant Town, Os Bay, um, after walking through the forest and seeing a deer flitting through the trees, you know, and thinking, was that set up by the Scottish tourism industry? <laughs> uh, I've also been to the Walker's Shortbread Factory that afternoon to buy some Walker's Shortbread, and got stuck in a traffic jam behind a Dewar's, I think, uh, tanker. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's again, it's like, is, have they organised this for a, for a classic? Yeah. Um, it's it's not as good as Dean's shortbread, though. Oh, well, here well, it goes. Oh. Well, now I know. Like, take, take a long walk off a short pier with that comment, mate. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a... Uh, nah. No, no, I will not. I, I've spent every year of my childhood going yes, to yes, the yes, shortbread no, factory at Dean's of Huntley, yeah. and it is the best shortbread yeah. Scotland yeah. has. I need to and put no this one, on you because... Fight me, fight me for this because it is the best shortbread going. I don't think you, you go, get to be and if, not about shortbread. If you, if if you go there, there, you can get the offcuts cheap as well, even better. Oh, that's right. You know, you're rewarded oh, for visiting. I think so. so, yes. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Kirsten says, sorry, Kirsten says. Is and, the best. You know what? Kirsten has a great palate, so uh, I'm going to go she's, with She's um, just not discovered Dean's yet. I don't think it's available in I haven't Australia. discovered Dean's. She's a little yeast geek like me as well. So. No, no one's discovered Dean's. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Anyway. Okay. Uh, That's a beautiful uh, memory. That just sounds like Scotland. Like everyone's like, oh, my God, it was so quintessential and it was amazing. And that is just Scotland. That's like That's everything right, yeah. that you run into yeah. and you just have these um, typical experiences that that's there every day, but they're just absolutely magical to us. Yeah. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah. Andy, I'll let you go. Come on, mate. Right. Here we go. Uh, well, it's a big, I think it's it's the classic journalist question. Uh, what phrase do you most overuse when you're talking <laughs> about whiskey? Or wine. Oh, Just yeah. in writing Amazing. in general, then. That's so interesting. I tell you what I overuse is brackets. I use I overuse parentheses. Uh, my what I overuse. This is a, a total language geek question. Is the semicolon? So I know I shouldn't. I know it's lazy. But if anybody's interested in writing out there, you'll know that the semicolon is your friend, but needs to be used sparingly um, because it becomes a bit uh, ugly and uh, after a while. That's the wrong answer, isn't it? Because in terms of tasting, what would my over I, 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 I tell you what it is, and it's a it's a wine word, not a whiskey word, unless you can tell me otherwise. Sinewy. 
Uh, sinewy. Good word. Sinewy tannins. That's my that's my fr- word of the month. Sinewy tannins. Sinewy that's sinewy. Just, tannins. That's I have really a thing with sinew in meat, so that just makes me like a little bit. I know it's horrible when you think about it. A lot, of, yep. a lot of words are. So, do yeah. you use that in place of chalky? No, no. It's it it, it, it implies a kind of intertwined tension. Like, yeah, uh, it's, it's a tension. It's like a chewy, like viscosity, like yeah, chewy yeah. tension on the tongue. Chewy meat. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah, hanging to hear that word come up in a SMWS live now. Yeah. It's a little bit like a night out with me, chewy and tense. <laughs> we'll put it on a bottle name. You know what? It'll become one of the bottle names. Or we'll call it Worm Tub Sinew or something on one of the bottle names. <laughs> Sinewy Tannin. All right. My turn. Um, this is one of my favourites. Um, and it's not – actually, I'm just going to say it so you can't – I'm not going to give you any – uh, direction with it. Who is the whiskey love of your life? Oh, in terms of, of like fanboy, is that what you uh, mean? It's a- no, the, the okay. question is the question. How you interpret it is up to you. Uh, I'm going to say my wife because that, that's really I have to. <laughs> uh, no, but it's true. Like we bonded over many things, but one of the things we bonded over was was some cast strength whiskeys from Rob Bins back in the oh. early nineties. That's at that time what that I was kind of girl. Yeah, that's hanging it. Out with, um, and Obbins, I think, was specialising in and some cast strength whiskies at the time. And obviously spending that time in Scotland with her and going to see these places and just and realising that 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 whiskey is an all-day drink, that was a good thing. Um, in terms of fanboy whiskey people, it's it's probably Peter from Belgrove. Yes. Uh, because of just like he's just was so out there so early on. Bill Lark is a legend, and I had the the absolute joy of, of being able to have lunch with him um, earlier this year, and just sit down and and, and being able to sit down and, and have lunch with Bill and talk about stuff other than whiskey was a real privilege and, and a joy. Um, so that'd be my three kind of off the top of my head, and I've probably yeah. left people who are going to resent me, but that's the nature of this thing, right? Yeah. So. yeah, that's right. No one else has mentioned Matt Bailey either, so you're clear on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, this has been so good. What? What? Oh, a, this has been amazing. I don't want it to end. I want to keep asking questions. But go. Wrap it up. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Go uh, buy my book. Buy my book. You know yes. what? Yeah. I've read it. I, it's absolutely spellbinding. It's so good. It's it's. It, it taught me so much about the, especially the early times of so many parts of um of drinks in Australia that I just didn't know anything about. Uh, I I um. I read a lot of whiskey books, and uh, this one was is not a whiskey book. It's it's a very good drinks book. So please, uh, yeah, I'd recommend getting that. Thank you. Yeah, um, Max, where, where 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 do they get it from? I know uh, maxallen.com.au, There's links there, but like where where do you go and buy it from? Do you have a preferred retailer or someone you like to point towards? You can put a link in. Yeah, um, uh, there's a really great. Uh, if if anybody hasn't come across this yet, there's a fabulous bookshop in Melbourne called Books for Cooks. So if you're remotely interested in food and drink of all got, shapes and sizes, he got the team over at Books and Cooks. Books yeah. and Cooks, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, he might still have a couple of signed copies there. Oh. Uh, all the usual online outlets, uh, but hopefully, gosh, any any good bookshop, you know, it should, it should still be out there. I think you can get it direct through the publisher as well, Thames and Hudson. So there's no excuse, <laughs> no excuse not to buy a copy. Yeah. Oh wow. And um, and be, be, before I let you go, for those who are who are watching and enjoy this podcast and enjoy, you know, the guests we've had on in the last you know year and a half, however long it's been, a sentiment that I echoed when we had Luke McCarthy on. If you yeah. enjoy this content, go and pay the makers of the content, whether that is subscribing to a website, whether that's buying a book. Whether it's Dave Broom or Becky Paskin or Luke McCarthy or Max Salmon we got, night, got on tonight, it is so important. For those who don't like me in the whiskey industry, if you paid more for writing, I'd still be a journalist. You wouldn't have to deal with me. Pay for the people because that is the research and the work is so vital to our industry and moving forward. And this book is is not just necessary reading if you're a whiskey or into wine, but if you just like a drink of all sorts. You know, it's. I, I would rate it up there with some of like the stuff that Cyril Pearl did back in the day on the on Whoa. the beer drinking culture of Australia. That is, you know, it is it is up there. Go out and find it. It is be the the best value um, purchase you'll make this year. You know, out, outside of a bottle of something. So go and do it. 
And and Max, thank you once again for lowering your, your very high standards to come and <laughs> summit with us tonight. You're welcome. Anytime. Thanks again, thank Max. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you Max. All right. We will sign up from the Facebook and YouTubes, wherever we are, and we will see you all next week probably. I assume so. I haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs>